Siento frágil al llegar la muerte. Real es el león de cuyo me hay cuidado tú. Oh, no le mumas o pena. Daría de yo a muerte me. Will berría al limitar. Deserto cruel Fez que eu aprendesse a ser feliz and shiny I can say that because it's been bright and shiny for the past two days uh, how many of you are enjoying the sunshine yeah every hand is raised with uh, some excitement there praise the Lord just a few announcements this morning uh, first of all welcome to the Centralia Seventh-day Adventist Church we're glad that you're here uh, for those of you who are online we welcome you also we're glad that you can spend this time worshiping with us and if you're new here today you're visiting thank you for uh, choosing Centralia we're glad that you're here with us uh, just a few announcements this morning. If you look in your bulletins, um, you'll notice it on Sunday, March 17th. And when is that? Very good. It says at 5 p.m., St. Patrick's Day Potato Social in the Fellowship Hall. Um, I know that uh, Kelly and I have kind of talked about this off and on, and uh, I'm so happy to see that there's going to be a potato social. Um, so everyone's welcome. Uh, please come and join. It'll be a beautiful day. It'll be a beautiful time. Come socialize and spend time with each other. Also, here in our bulletin, it says Fellowship Hall Side Room Cleaning. Just as a last notice, there is one week left for you to remove anything that you um, find important out there. At least make sure that it's allocated to the right place. If not, it will be removed for you. Uh, no longer to be seen. Uh, that is a, a wonderful room out there that uh, can be a great resource for the church. It has not been used in that way, and so we are going to uh, make every effort to make sure that uh, 
it is used appropriately to the glory of God. So if you have anything in that side room, I'm just letting you know now, you better get a hold of it. All right, um, I have some slides. And I don't have a clicker, so you'll need to move with me. Um, first of all, we have our mission statement. I'm going to be bringing this up from time to time as long as I'm here, unless the statement changes. I just want to remind us why we do what we do and what Centralia Seventh Adventist Church is all about. And you'll see here that your mission statement, our mission statement says, loving others into a life-saving relationship with Jesus Christ. So no matter what we believe in the the Ah, thank you. You're awesome. Clicker. Um, what was I saying? Oh, our belief system, we have a lot of things that we believe, um, but everything should be couched in this idea that um, we're doing it and we're sharing what we believe and we're living the life we live because we love other people. That's what it boils down to. The Bible tells us that God is what? Love. And if he's in our heart, uh, there should be a natural expression of love flowing from us to the world around us. No matter what we believe or, or, or what we're sharing, um, all the things that God has given to us need to be shared with a loving and kind and tender heart. So just remember, our mission is to love others into a life-saving relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the most important thing. Here on the screen, um, a reminder that uh, in two weeks, not this coming week, but the following week, we are starting this book in prayer meeting. It's called Adventism's Greatest Need. We're going to cover one chapter a week, and this is how it works uh, if you participate in, in prayer meeting. Uh, this book is available to you. By the way, you see that, 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 that word written in red? What does it say? Free. This is a free resource for uh, the first 20 people that come and get it, and it's not a cheap resource. Um, if you go buy this at the store, it's probably between $15 and $20. So we're making this available to everybody who will be participating during prayer meeting who can come and, and get it. So if you're interested in this, before March 26th, I would say come and talk to me so that I can get this resource into your hands. Um, we're going to have a fantastic time together. Uh, we'll read a chapter before we get together, and then we're going to come and just talk about that chapter, the things that we found and uh, the scriptures and, and the book and just how it applies to us. And we want to grow together spiritually. What do you, what do you say about that? Amen. We want to learn how to, to live for the Lord and love the Lord. And we want to understand what his purpose is for us. And we're going to be studying about the Holy Spirit and how God wants uh, him uh, to work in our lives and the power that we have uh, with the Holy Spirit in our lives. So um, one chapter weekly. This is Thursday morning and Wednesday evening. Um, Thursday morning is TBA. I still want to talk to those people. I haven't had much response for the morning group. If you're interested in this, please let me know. I know that there have been people who are interested but haven't said much. If you are, please let me know. We can't make plans if you don't share your desire to be a part of those plans. So please let me know if you're interested. And uh, there are, were sign-up sheets, but at this point in time, I've taken them down. If you have an interest, please come see me. I'll be glad to, to get you set up with a resource in preparation for March 26th, our first Wednesday evening with this book. Um, in uh, our Ellen G. White's writings, 1887, she says, A revival of true godliness is the greatest and most urgent of all of our needs. To seek it should be our first work, and that's what we want to do on Wednesday evenings. I don't believe that the church can survive without the Holy Spirit. I just don't. And I know that the more I talk about him and, and the more I study about him and the more I ask for his blessing, the happier I am. And my purpose becomes more clear. My motivation becomes stronger and my spiritual strength rises. And so I want the same for all of you. So be encouraged uh, take the, the initiative by faith, step out and say, hey, I'm going to be at prayer meeting. I want to be a part of this Bible study taking place from week from week to the next. Um, total member involvement. We haven't talked about this for a while. Just a reminder. Um, it's a full-scale world church evangelistic thrust that involves every member. How many members? Every member. All, all members. Yep, everyone. Every church, every administrative entity, every type of public outreach ministry, personal and institutional outreach. The reason that the Seventh-day Adventist Church uh, believes in total membership involvement and, and this emphasis uh, at this point in history is because we believe that Jesus is coming. And we want to reach as many people as possible. And, and it's the, the, the necessity is that all of us, at the level that God has called us with the gifts that we have, whether they're one or 20, that we walk with Jesus and we become a part of this movement at the end of time in preparation for his return. We're told that the work of God on this earth can never be finished until the men and women comprising our church membership 
rally to the work and unite their efforts with those of ministers and church officers. So as your pastor, I definitely want to work with you on this. So if you feel called to be uh, a, a bigger part of what's happening in Centralia, but you just don't know how, let's talk about it. Or if you have a plan, you have an idea, let's talk about that too. I, I believe that God has a place for all of us. And we talked about that last week. Uh, God has given to each one of us in the church a gift and talent, and he wants us to use it for the benefit of his church, for the glory of his kingdom, and also for our own personal spiritual development and fulfillment. I went the wrong way. There we go. So this is what total member, member involvement is all about. Everyone doing something for Jesus. And so I put two more things on the screen. I'm actually just from week to week uh, using this right here. So hopefully you all still have this. And if you don't, shame on you. If you need one, I'll be glad to give it to you. By no means is this a complete exhaustive list, but it's some great ideas in here uh, when you're just wondering, what is it that I can do this week to serve the Lord? Some of them are very practical. There's two more practical things here. Do laundry for a friend or co-worker who has just had a baby. Um, and number 12 on our list, assist a blind person. And maybe these opportunities will come to you this week. If they don't, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be helping somebody. It just means that you didn't have these opportunities. And if you go in here and you look, you're going to find that there are at least 100 things that you could do to be a blessing to someone else and to share Jesus this week with someone. Just want to review this GROW um, model that we're using here in Centralia, why we're doing what we're doing. Remember, the GROW process has five different components. It's preparing, planting, cultivating, harvesting, and preserving. And I think I have the next one here. So what that means for us practically is that um, for our first one, which is prepare, it's church-wide need-based ministries both inside and outside. So we're seeking for revival here in the first part of our year, but we're also implementing uh, things in the community to help us connect with the, the community at large so that they can see that we're genuinely interested uh, in, in blessing them and serving them. Also, it says active literature and media ministry. I will just let you know that um, some of those things are going on already. Um, before David and Jennifer left, David was um, sharing Bible studies with the community. Uh, those Bible studies continue, and uh, we're adding more Bible studies. Each week, I get more requests for Bible studies, just so you know. And so my cup is getting full. And so if there are any, and there are more Bible studies coming, I'm just going to tell you that. Um, and I, I'm thanking the Lord for that. But if, there are any, if there's anyone in here who would like to give Bible studies in the community, or at least make contacts with Bible students in the community, let me know. I'll be glad to, to do that with you and help you get started, and that maybe it's a ministry that you can take on yourself. Also, a vibrant Bible study ministry. This is just a development of our program where we're getting people more and more involved specifically with Bible study and the teachings of our church. And in the fall, we'll have a regular, uh, uh, an evangelistic meeting. This is just a regular part of the, of, of the cycle. And one thing that we miss often is our discipleship ministry. People are baptized into the church uh, and we're thankful that the Lord has touched them with the truth and they've received that truth. But as a church, sometimes we fail in encouraging those new members in the church. And it's a struggle for a new member to come into a church. Even though they've heard everything that they've heard in an, at an evangelistic meeting, it doesn't mean that they know all there is to know. They're just getting their feet wet. They're newborn babes when it comes to, to the understanding of the belief system of this church. And so what they need more than anything is a group of people who love the Lord and who love them and are willing to make sacrifices to care for them as they grow into mature, into mature Christians. And so we have a very specific component that we'll be implementing here in Centralia to make sure that uh, these new members that come into our church will be cared for appropriately. So these are the things that are happening in your church. This is our, our process. We want to start at the beginning with just introducing ourselves to the community and providing needs-based programming. And also, if they're interested, uh, getting them in touch with resources that help them to know a little bit more about us. And if they are more interested, we help them uh, with Bible studies and sharing those Bible studies with them. And if they're really interested, we want them to be a part of, of growing even more. And we want them to, to come and, and hear the evangelistic messages that we've been given. And if they, if they love that message, and they receive that message that's being preached from the Bible, and they become members of our church, we want them to be long-standing members. We want them to grow in the Lord. We want them to use their spiritual gifts. We want them to be a part of preparing others for the kingdom. So this is what we do at Centralia Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'm not going to go through all the things that we have planned. You all have heard that, but I'll review it at some point in time in the future. Finally, 
our mission statement, loving others into a life-saving relationship with Jesus Christ, is our mission. And I encourage you to be a part of that mission here in Centralia. Well, let's prepare our hearts for worship. And again, I'm so thankful that all of you are here. Welcome to the Centralia Seventh-day Adventist Church. Okay, our next hymn will be on page 290. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Oh soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see There's light for a look at the Savior And life more abundant and free Turn your eyes upon Jesus Look full in His wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Through death into life everlasting, He passed and we follow Him there. Over us sin no more at the minion, for more than conquerors we are. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in His wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. In the light of His glory and grace His word shall not fail you He promised Believe Him and all will be well Then go to a world that is dying His perfect salvation <laughs> to Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in His wonderful face, and the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of His glory. Okay, our next hymn will be on page 309, I Surrender All. All to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give, I will Trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. To Jesus I surrender, humbly at His feet I bow, worldly pleasures all forsaken, take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all, I 
surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed I surrender all, all to Jesus, I surrender, make me Savior, holy thine, let me fill the Holy Spirit, truly know that thou art mine, I surrender all, I surrender. I surrender all, all to Jesus, I surrender, now I feel the sacred flame, all the joy of people, salvation, glory, glory to His name. surrender all I surrender all all to thee my blessed Savior I surrender all oh what a blessing it is to be with my church family again today amen okay our next is number 373, one of my favorites, Seeking the Lost. <laughs> Seeking the lost, just kindly entreating, wanders on the mountain astray, coming to me, his message repeat. Words of the Master speaking today, going afar upon the mountain, bringing the wander back again into the fold of my Redeemer, Jesus the Lamb. And pointed to Jesus Souls that are weak And hearts that are sore Leading them forth In ways of salvation Showing the path to life evermore Going upon Upon the mountain Redeemer, Jesus the Lamb for sinners slain. Thus I would go on missions of mercy, following Christ from day unto day, sharing the faint and raising the fallen, pointing to Jesus the way, going upon, upon a mountain, bringing the wander back again, into the fold of my Redeemer, Jesus the Lamb. Sinner slain. 
Thank you, church family, for singing. Well, it's my turn to say good morning and uh, just say some opening remarks here. It's good to see you all. And uh, I do have a c couple of things to say. I tend to wander sometimes, so I just want to tell you that um, where I'm going is to announce the next song, Kevin, and, and then you can come up and lead again. Uh, so if you're wondering where I'm going with what I'm going to say now, just know that we're going to end up with that opening hymn, okay? <laughs> Yesterday, uh, Kelly and I were had breakfast together, and, and then I had an errand to run afterwards. And uh, I went to a store for Faye, and I met the lady who was in charge there, and clerk, and uh, that experience was an amazing experience to me. Uh, I could tell that, that she uh, probably had moved to this country, or her parents had, from the other side of the Pacific. I wasn't sure which country but it wasn't too long before I found out because I asked her. <laughs> I said, so which country did you or your parents come from? And uh, when you came over here, she had a little bit of an accent, but not bad. She said, from Korea. Oh, okay. And then she told me a little bit about her experience. She'd been here for about 42 years. And uh, she was a teenager when she came over. And then she immediately launched into, um, how can I put it? I don't think she was attempting to convert me. But she was telling me what her experience was. I, I, I'd asked her, so what was the main religion? Aside from, I know Christianity is kind of really... Uh, grown over there in South Korea anyway, uh, over the years. And she, but what was the main religion? And she said it was Buddhist. And, uh, and then she started to talk about Buddha. And, you know, <laughs> I had a picture of Buddha that I had never had before. And one of the first ones, near the first, she said, do you know that if you were in my country, what was my country, people would say you had Buddha ears. <laughs> what? <laughs> Buddha ears? <laughs> well, yes, I, they're ears like Buddha. So now I'm thinking, well, I know I have. I learned not too many years ago that I had large ears. And so I asked her, you mean large ears? No. Well, just the the lower part you have large earlobes okay so then i asked her because i can be direct i said was well, is that a derogatory statement you're making or just an observation and she was i don't know she didn't know exactly how to answer that but she said well no it's just, it's just that they look like buddhas and then she went on to say and that means that you're either going to be rich or are you going to have a long life? Well, I was pretty sure I knew that rich wasn't going to be the, the one thing. So I said, well, I am 84, or we'll be in a couple of weeks. She said, oh, well, then I guess that's what it is. <laughs> and then she continued on about Buddha. And the thing that she missed, there were, she missed the peace that she enjoyed being with her fellow believers. And she talked about that. And she talked about since being in this country. It was kind of like that when she came, but it's not that way anymore. And she talked about Christians. And the words that come out of Christians' mouths, some of them were people driving cars that weren't real happy. And sometimes they were people that came into work, but she, somehow she equated them as being Christian. But 
they were not people who had peace in their hearts. And I felt really bad about that. But she went on and talked about that. And she talked about how peace, they don't kill. Buddhists who really follow don't kill. They don't even kill animals, so they don't eat meat. How about that? You know, I tell you, I, I begin to feel like I want what she has. No, I want the environment that she's talking about. That's what I wanted. Yeah, if I didn't have already a deep-seated relationship with Christ and belief and understanding, I, I think I'd almost been like that, like uh, the guy that said to Paul, "Almost you persuade me." And she was missing that. And then I got to thinking about, am I one of those? She, oh, and let me, I forget this other part. And I'm going to stop here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she said, in my time here in this country, I have only met that I know of three people who follow truly the Christian teachings in the Bible. Three people. And one of them was her best friend. Uh, now, obviously, she doesn't know everybody's heart, but that was quite a statement. Um, the Lord wants us to have peace in our hearts. We can have more than what Buddha's followers have because we have a Savior who's come to redeem the world. And he's given us a message to share with others. And that's why I'm coming to our opening song, because our opening song is about Jesus, the lamb that was slain for sinners. And I'd like to invite you to sing it with us. Now, as Kevin comes up, it's hymn number 246. I'll say this again. What a pleasure it is to be with my church family today. God you are that we serve. What a beautiful Sabbath day you bless us with, Lord, that we can enjoy all your creation. Lord, when you ascended, you said you would send the Comforter to be with us until you came again. 
And so saying, we ask that your Holy Spirit would be here with us today. You be with our speaker today. Dwell on our hearts, Lord, for the rest of this Sabbath day. And we ask these things in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. It's time now for us to take up the morning offering. Uh, in the little brochure I have here regarding giving, I just want to read this one little part. It says, today we can rest in knowing that our God is able to calm all of the storms in our lives. Even deeper than that, God is able to give us a sense of peace when the world around us feels like it is in chaos. We're blessed to be able to gather as believers and encourage each other with our testimonies of how God has carried us through. Hope we do that. Now, when we have tithes in the hall and so forth, as we return our tithes and offerings today, let our hearts give from a place of gratitude from our storm-calming God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we give our tithes and our offerings today, Lord, may it represent truly from hearts that are filled with thanksgiving Thank you for giving us the opportunity to have a part in this wonderful work of sharing the good news about Jesus. In his name I pray, amen. Offerings today is for local budget, church budget. Thank you. Time now for the children's story. And as they're coming up front, I invite the children to go back and get the baskets for collecting the children's offering, which is given to the um, church school, Lewis County Adventist School. And uh, nothing more, it seems like the children enjoy taking up the offering. And then Matt Gillum's going to give them a story as a, as a reward.
Hi, kids. How are you? Good. Well, I was thinking about a story this week, and I had asked some people, what do they like? What kind of stories do they like? Do they like object lesson stories, or do they like adventure stories? And somebody who was an adult said, childhood stories. So I'm going to tell you a childhood story. How many here are 10 years old? Are you 10? Everybody's under 10 years old. Well, I was about 10 years old, and I rode my bike to school. And where I lived, we were about a mile and a half from the school. And one morning, I got up late. I was running late, and I raced out the door, and I noticed that it was kind of cold outside. It was really foggy. So I ran back in for my gloves and my hat, and I threw my hat on, but I could not find my gloves anywhere. And I said, I can't look for my gloves. I have to go to school. So I started riding my bike to school, and it was really foggy out, and there was mist, and my hands got super, super cold. And I was kind of thinking, praying in my head, Jesus, I don't know what to do. My hands are so cold. And I thought about trying to stick one hand inside my coat as I rode my bike and then switch. But then I had a thought, why don't you take your hat off and put your hand in your hat and ride that way? And then you could trade and ride it with the other, put it on the other hand and ride. So I took off my hat. And I put my hand inside my hat, and what do you think I found? <laughs> I found my gloves. I was so excited, so I put my gloves on, and I put my hat back on, and I rode the rest of the way to school. And I was so excited that I told the teacher about my answer to prayer. Now, I just want to read a little Bible verse to you today that I thought of. It is Proverbs, or Psalms 18, verse 6, and it said, In my trouble I called to the Lord. I cried out to my God for help. From his temple he heard my voice. My call for help reached his ears. I want you kids to know that when you feel like you're in trouble, you can call out to Jesus. And I want the adults behind me to know that they can call out to Jesus when they're in trouble too. So, who feels like they've ever been in a little bit of trouble? Well, let's say a prayer. Dear God, we want to thank you for these kids and for these adults, and we ask, Lord, that you'll be with us today, that you'll uh, go with us through this week. Um, help us to remember to cry out to you when we need help. In your name, amen. You can go back. Time now for our morning prayer. As we prepare for that, let's turn in our bulletin. <laughs> There's a page here that has the uh, prayer songs in the back, I believe. I don't know why I have a hard time finding it. Ah, there it is. It is indeed. Let's kneel for prayer and sing our prayer song and. Kevin will lead us when we sing. Now, dear Lord, as we pray, take our hearts and minds far away. From the press of the world all around To your throne where grace does abound May our lives be transformed by your love May our souls be refreshed from above 
At this moment, let people everywhere join us now as we come to you in prayer. Father in heaven, I'm thankful that we can come to you in a house that is full of peace. We know it's full of peace because your Holy Spirit is here. And yet, Lord, we may not have peace deep down in our hearts. Some, some may, and some may not. And Lord, first of all, my prayer is that as we are here worshiping together, whether it's in song or reading your scripture, listening to the songs of praise, or hearing the word expounded on by our pastor, I pray that the Holy Spirit will give us peace and a deeper peace, perhaps, than we've had. A peace that comes from being made right with you and know that that we can walk with you that you walk with us and that having the assurance that in that walk that we are together for no two people can walk together unless they be agreed so help us Lord to be in agreement with you and to know that joy and the fulfillment of your promise. The Sabbath, or this Sabbath school lesson this week has been so full of promises of joy and peace and uh, all those good things that come from being right with you. Help us not to hold back, Lord, because we feel unworthy. Of course we're unworthy but you love us anyway. And that's why you came to this world is because we were unworthy. So we pray for that blessing. And Lord, there are families and friends that we know of who may not have that peace. Some of that is because of physical illness, perhaps. And we pray for them that the illness might be overcome, whether it's by healing of the body or healing of the soul. And some it has to do with relationships, relationship with you or relationship with others that gets in the way. Lord, our our church membership seems to, um, our friends and our church, we seem to be experiencing more and more of the chaos that comes from a world that is attacked by our arch enemy, Satan. And we see it in wars and we see it shouted from cars in the streets, we see it on the sidewalks, and sometimes we see it in the homes. Lord, we long for healing of that. And uh, just pray for your presence to be dominant here today. And we thank you for the promise that if we pray, you will hear our prayer and you will answer. In Jesus' name, amen.
Our scripture this morning is taken from Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. And when I looked at it, and I read it, I, I saw that it could be applied in a couple of ways. And uh, I suspect that it might be helpful to apply it in both ways and not just one. It's very short and to the point. Malachi says, or he's speaking for the Lord, I am the Lord and I do not change. That is why you descendants of Jacob are not already completely destroyed. Aren't you glad that Jesus doesn't change? He loves us no matter what. I believe we have a song.
There we go. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that even in this world we can experience the outpouring of your fathomless billows of love upon us. And before we begin, if there are any in here who are weary after a week of life in this sinful world, I pray that you bring them your peace that passes understanding. Take them into your loving arms, Lord, and remind them that you love them with an everlasting love. Give us your spirit this morning as we talk together, and we pray that you would make things clear and simple to us, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of our sermon is Times Are Changing. Um, how many of you remember that thing on the left-hand side there? What do we call that? Yeah, <laughs> telephone. Do we use them anymore? I, some people might. I've seen them in places occasionally still. They're being used, but for the most part, they, they become obsolete. Well, the first um, telephone was patented by Alexander Graham Bell. You remember him, right? 1876. Uh, he made his first telephone call using the telegraphic network in Ontario, and he made a call over an eight-mile distance. Ooh, right? <laughs> then in 1915, we had the first call from coast to coast here in the USA. Getting big. And at this point, there were various companies that were established, and they were focusing on the development uh, of the service and providing the service to, to everyone. And then the telephone became publicly available, and in 1927, we had the first transatlantic call between the USA and the UK. So I, I bring this up in the history of the telephone because look where we're at now, there on the right-hand side. Uh, not only can we reach people across the Atlantic, we can reach people across the globe at any given point in time instantaneously. And the message is clear and precise, and if we have the right phone... We can just touch a button, and all of a sudden their faces pop up instantaneously from somewhere across the world. Times are changing, and there is even more technology out there that's just amazing, but um, we see the transition from the old ways to the new ways. On the next side, we have something similar. We have, anybody know what that, whoops, that thing on the top is? Radio. Radio began in 1893 with Nikola Tesla, and he uh, was demonstrating the wireless radio message transfer in St. Louis um, in 1893. And in 1922, a man by the name of Marconi created the first radio station in the UK. Anybody know what that radio station was, was called, was, was titled? B, B, C. Still around today. BBC. That was back in 1922. The radio was used throughout various countries and for various purposes, such as entertainment and news for a long period of time. People would gather around the radio and they would listen instead of watch because they didn't have the privilege of watching just yet. So they would gather around the radio and they would listen to the different uh, uh, news items and entertainments that were available in that time. And it was in 1960 that the FM radio waves were found and it made the signals even clearer and the quality was better. Well, think about what we have today. It's amazing what we have today. Well, we moved from the radio to the television, which came next, but radio fostered a real-time conversation amongst people uh, during challenging times like the Depression and, and World War, and it became the single greatest force before television and internet in developing a mass culture of, of sports and entertainment and news and advertising. The radio is where it all began. Well, it moved on to the TV in 1927, the first electric television. And by the way, that's, a, that's what it looked like right there. That's your first television. Uh, what kind of TVs do we have now? They cover like whole walls in our homes, right? And they're not even that wide. They're like a fraction of that wide. But in 1927, the first one was created by a young man. He was 21 years old, and his name was Philio Taylor Farnsworth. Keith, you know him? <laughs> His name was uh, Philio Farnsworth, and he combined the principles of radio and telephone. He brought these two technologies together to make the transmission of images efficient. So we can see the advancement. Times were changing. New things were being created, and it benefited the human race. His first image was just a straight line, and I actually watched a video on this. It was fascinating um, how it all took place. Uh, we would look at it, and we would say, <laughs> okay, what's next? It was that unentertaining, but for them, it was revolutionary uh, during, during the uh, early uh, 18th or 20th century. An investor asked the young man, Filio, when they were going to see some dollars from this invention, and it was at this point that young Filio said this. 
or did this. On his little television screen, he transmitted the picture of a dollar sign on his TV prototype, and he was telling them, hey, it's worth the money. Color TV came in 1946. Some of you may have remembered that transition. And so we went from the radio to television, and now we have the World Wide Web where we can access anything at any given point in time and recall things that have happened in decades past. It's amazing how technology has advanced. And not only that, but we have advancements in travel. Uh, you can see here, I couldn't find a good, a good picture that would, would uh, show us what life was like before uh, the, the, uh, the transportation that we have now. But uh, back in the olden days, we might say, in the pioneer days, they did a lot of walking and they did a lot of horseback riding, traveling in carriages and covered, covered wagons and things like that. But slowly things advanced and we have the car that was developed, the first modern car uh, was a practical, marketable automobile automobile for everyday use, and it was created by Carl Benz in 1886. He developed a gasoline-powered automobile and made several identical copy, copies, and from 1886, many inventors and entrepreneurs got into what they would call the horseless carriage business. That's what they called cars when they first came out. Horses carriage business, both in America and Europe, and inventions and innovations rapidly furthered the development and production of automobiles. And now we have something like this Tesla truck in the bottom. You can imagine what the pioneers might have said if they would have saw something like this in their time. And then not only that, but we can't just travel along the ground, but now we can travel through the air and we don't even think anything about it. My friends, times are changing. When I see all these changes, I get excited because the limits, well, there are no limits. And fantastic things are happening in our world. But when it comes to all the changes, there's, there's one change that I want to see. There's one change that I want to experience, and that's the change of my own heart. The Bible says this. It was the plea of David. He said, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. That's what he longed for, a new heart. And today I want to encourage you to pray the, for the same thing. Ask God for a new heart and a right spirit. To be excited about the, the changes that are coming because the world is changing and it's not changing in good ways and we're going to talk about that. But ultimately the change is going to be fantastic because what I read in my Bible is this old world that's passing away like an old garment, the Bible says, is going to one day be made new again. There's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. And how long will that new heavens and new earth last? forever, my friends. The change will be incredible. Well, in our world today, we have what we would call a crisis of change. About a week ago, I heard a sincere, faithful Christian share his concern with a tenant of the Adventist faith, and it, it challenged my thinking as I heard him, him question his own belief system and the belief system of our church. There was a concern that some of the things that we believed had become outdated. And instead of encouraging the teaching, the church should be more accepting, put aside the teaching, and should be changing with the times because what we believe has become outdated. Well, I'm open to dialogue and I'm open to change if it's merited by the Word of God. In our world today, many of the changes that are being called for are not biblical. And if followed, will slowly remove from us the foundation of truth that God has so graciously given to this church. I know that many Christians are discouraged. And it's easy to become discouraged because we look at ourselves and we experience failure and we experience difficulty in our Christian experience and, and we want to give up. And many today are on the verge of giving up, but I, I want to tell any of you who might be feeling that way, don't give up. God is bigger than any problem that you have. And he's faithful. And if you have a need, he is more than capable and willing, of meet, or willing to meet that need. But we have to ask for it. So if you're feeling discouraged, don't be discouraged. The Bible says that if we come to him, he won't cast us out. He won't turn us away. Jesus died so that we might receive the help that we need in the broken world that we live in. I want to also tell you as we move into our sermon that we have a wonderful and merciful Savior. Amen? I love that song. Wonderful, merciful Savior, blessed Redeemer and Lord. Amen. 
He loves us. He's never left us or forsaken us. And he's always ready to forgive us and restore to us, again, what David had prayed for, the joy of salvation, to give us an understanding of our future and to remind us that he has great plans for each one of us. He can bring us off more than conquerors, the Bible says. So if you're struggling with sin, if you're struggling with doubt or fear or discouragement, just remember you have a great and mighty God that you serve. And you just need to look to the cross this morning and look beyond that cross for a moment and you can see that there's someone named Jesus who died for your sins. And he was raised again so that you would have power to overcome the sin and to resist the temptation and to be faithful to the God who loved you and gave his life for you. But our world is changing and I felt for this man that I heard question the tenet of our faith. And it does seem to be outdated if you're following the world's parameters. If you're following the world's principles, it does feel outdated. But my friends, we're not following worldly principles. We're following biblical principles. We're following biblical teachings. And one thing that I've learned in my study of the Bible is this, that when we first start studying, we receive a surface knowledge, if you will. God gives us what we need. Paul calls it the milk of the word. But it's expected of us that we would search the scriptures because Jesus says that in them we have eternal life. It's where we learn all about the God of our salvation. It's where we find strength and power to live a faithful life to God. But Paul says we don't remain just drinking the milk. He says we need to get into the meat of the word. And Jesus said, it said the same thing. He said it like this. He says, you've heard in times past, thou shalt not do this. But then he said these words, thou, but I say unto you, this is what you should do. And so one of the things that he says is that you should not commit adultery. He says, you've heard in times past that you shouldn't commit adultery. But then he said, I say unto you, that even if you look on a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery. And so God gives us a deeper understanding of those basic principles that we learn when we first come to him. And so there's an expectation that we should be learning and growing and understanding the specifics of our faith and the depth of the truths that we've been given so that we're not moved off the foundation of truth that God has placed us upon. Do you know why people step off the foundation of their faith? Because they lose their focus on the Word of God. If you're studying your Word, and if you're praying and asking for the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit, God will reveal to you the deeper things of God. He wants you to know those things. So don't get discouraged if you feel like you don't know enough. We'll never know all there is to know, and we'll constantly be learning all throughout eternity, but know what you can while you have the opportunity. Dig deep into the Word of God and, and learn. And if you're just starting, it's okay. Grab what you can. I remember when I first started reading my Bible for the right reasons. Anybody remember when they first forayed in, into the Scriptures? Anybody? Yeah. I remember I opened up the Bible, and this is when I was in prison, and I opened it up because I just knew that that's where I needed to be. And I opened up that Bible, and I expected to see and hear great things. And you know what happened? I didn't see and hear great things. I could not understand what was written on those pages. I looked at the pages, and I often tell in my story that I looked down there, and the words looked like they were moving on the page. It looked like a bunch of ants running around on the page. I just couldn't focus in on what was written because of my previous experience. I was uh, coming off four or five years of living a, a, a terrible uh, lifestyle, and, and now I was trying to correct that way, and I brought myself to the Lord, and I realized how much I needed Him because I couldn't even look at the pages of the Scripture and understand them. But I will be happy to tell you today that God has revealed Himself to me through His Word. And it wasn't by my might or by my power, but it was by His Spirit. He began to give me my mind back, and He fulfilled His promise to me, I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. All those years that sin destroyed, I'm going to give back to you and I'm going to give you your mind back. You all remember the story of the demoniac and how he came down and he was confronted by Jesus. And we see that after his confrontation with Jesus, he was clothed and he was in his right mind. He was able to think straight again. And I often refer to that story because I think that I was the same type of person that I couldn't think straight, I didn't know the Lord, and in my heart of hearts I wanted to, but I just couldn't get to him. Well, one day he came to me, just like he came to the demoniac in Gadara. He came to me, and he communicated his love and his desire for my salvation, and that's when everything changed. It wasn't perfect, and I still had to grow, but in that change 
in that process, he led me to an understanding of his word. And my friends, I'm so thankful that I know the God of the Bible today. In our world, we have a crisis of truth. We have a crisis of change because there's a redefining of of biblical terms into worldly terms. And one of those terms is the redefining of the terms of humanity. And God couldn't have been more clear. He couldn't have been more clear when defining how the human race would develop and fill the earth. Remember, there were just how many? And they were Adam and Eve. And so in Genesis chapter 1, oh, we forgot the watches. We're not talking about the watches. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 28, the Bible says God created man or mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and what? Female, he created them. Then God blessed them and and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. God set the precedence at the very beginning beginning of time of how the human race would develop. He says, I'm making man and woman. And in the context of man and woman, the race will continue to grow and develop. And this was his standard for the human family. We don't see that today. We see something very different promoted today in our world. I won't get into that topic, but I wanted to show you that there's a redefining of terms. Now, when we think of the human family, we are chastised for for thinking and talking about the reality that God created man to be with woman and woman to be with man. And that's the only definition of the human human race and family that God has given to us when it comes to relationship. Of course, we have families and we have brothers and sisters and all of that. But when it comes to procreation and filling the earth and fulfilling God's will, it began with man and woman and it has always been that way. But in our world, there's a redefining of truth. There's also the redefining of the terms of worship. And we're seeing a passive attack upon the Sabbath today and that worship on that special day that God has given to us. And many may uh, be ignorant to it, but there's a huge movement in our world today to, ch- to, to be a part of, of the Sunday movement or the Sunday uh, keeping movement. The push for Sunday as a day of rest is gaining ground, and it comes packaged in a beautiful package. And I just want to share some things with you. This was something that I came across some time ago, and I, this is my thought, and I'll share some other things with you. But we have... Um, something called the European Sunday Alliance, and there's other entities out there also, but this is just what I want to share with you today. But I said here, the Vatican continues to press the EU, the European Union, to enact Sunday laws. A movement within the EU called the European Sunday Alliance is at the forefront as an activist group proactively appealing for all of Europe to promote life, work balance, and social cohesion. Underlying it all is the Vatican Alliance, and their motivation is the same. They want to have a life-work balance, and they also want social cohesion, but with the subtle aspect of getting back to God by resting on Sunday. That's the motivation. The European Sunday Alliance, these are their own words from their website, They say that they're a network of national Sunday alliances, trade unions, civil society organizations, and religious communities committed to raise awareness of the unique value of, listen, synchronized free time. That's another way of saying getting everybody together on the same day to do the same thing. For the European societies, my friends, of course, there's bigger plans. This is a global plan, and it's been prophesied for a long time. Sunday... It goes on to say, in more general, decent working hours are the focus of our campaigns. Well, why Sunday? That was my question. I have a whole different sermon that, that speaks directly to this, but when I was writing that sermon, I said, why Sunday? Why not Monday? Why not Tuesday? Why not Wednesday? If we're going to have a day, why don't we just pick one? But why are we picking Sunday? Well, the Bible tells us why. Because there's a movement to bring all the world to worship the beast at the end of time. We don't have time to get into that sermon, but I want you to see the reality. There's a redefining of terms. There's a redefining of the terms of worship here, and it's so subtle because it goes on to say, we want to draw attention to the aspects of the life-work balance. That sounds really good. Life-work balance is something that we desperately need in our world today. Social cohesion, we definitely need social cohesion because in our world today, we're so fragmented. I was walking down my road, down Joppish Road, and um, just up the road, there's a, a little cattle farm there. I mean, he has about 10, 12 cows. Um, and uh, there, he just had some new ones. They're just adorable. And so uh, Isabella and I, were, Nayeli and I were walking, and there was a little one that was laying up by the fence, and mom was right there with her. And we went down and we looked at Rainier and we came back up the road. And as we came back up the road, we just saw the little baby sitting there. And I was wondering in my mind if that little baby was okay. Well, I saw the owner of the cattle coming and we met him at the fence. And 
uh, we just had a conversation, and it was a nice conversation. And he says, you know, I'm so glad that I met you today. He says, it was really good talking to you, and I hope that I see you again walking up and down the road. And I just thought, wow, what a wonderful moment. Just to be able to share a social moment with someone that I didn't know, a neighbor, it reminded me of what I might call the old days, right? When you just were, you were able to go to your neighbor's house and knock on the door without having the police called on you or a gun pulled on you. And now this is the, the world that we live in. People don't want you to come to their door anymore. It doesn't even matter who you are. And some family members don't want their family members coming to the door. It's just the world we live in. So social cohesion is a good idea. And it says that depend on a vast majority of people, which is interesting language, interesting language because the Bible says at the end of the world, all the world would wonder after the beast. To have their lawful free time. And all of a sudden, it's no longer just free time. It's no longer just social cohesion. It's lawful free time. In other words, it's going to be mandated. It's going to be written in stone. It's going to be a part of, of the law. And you have that privilege now, according to the law, to rest on that specific day. And it all sounds good, but where where does it take us? It seems like it's being done for all the right reasons, to protect our health and to respect the family and our own private life and to allow us to experience social cohesion. And that's such an interesting one, by the way, and we won't get into all that. But when I read this, I realized that this movement and others like it are really redefining the terms of the worship of the true God because you'll remember in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11, we have this call to worship. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And of course, everybody's just fine with that first part of that commandment, but the commandment doesn't stop there. And there's warfare against this commandment, even in our world today. But God is very clear. He says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And then he says in these verses, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. And I've even heard people go so far as to say, well, we don't even know what the Sabbath day is. I just point them to the Jewish community and say, that people, that people has been around since the giving of the commandments. And they know exactly when the Sabbath is. And my friends, God has not hidden from us which day the Sabbath day is. And he says, remember it because I want you to keep it holy. And so at the end of these passages, the end of that Sabbath commandment, God says, therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. There is a call to worship God on his day and not another day. And we see that there's a redefining of these terms in the world that we live in now. Also, there's a redefining of obligations. You've, I, you've probably heard this, and I've heard this quite a bit, but we're, we hear people say all the time, I'm going to live my truth. Have you heard that? I want to live my truth. I hear it from Christians. And they're proud to say it. I want to live my truth. I want to live my life the way that I want to live. And I would say, maybe we need to think through that real quick. Because to live our truth, if it's just us, and God is not involved with that truth, is to live in opposition to him. There's no sense of the greater obligation to the church in the world or the God that it serves anymore, it seems, in our church, because people want to live their truth. They want to do what they want to do. And my friends, I want to, in to encourage you once again to get back to the word of God and let that be the standard of your life choice and of, of your Life choices. Your obligation, your obligation alone is to the Lord. He's the one that saved you. He's the one that's redeemed you. He's the one that's prepared a future for you. And we are obligated in faith to serve him with all of our heart and all that we have, whether it's monetary or spiritual or physical, all that we have, we're to give glory to God with. There's a redefining of salvation in the world that we live in. Many ways of salvation are purported, but the Bible says there's only one. There's no salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Amen. In Jesus' plan, his death would give us access to all the powers of heaven. It's something we can pray for, by the way. The salvation brings to us the power of God to escape temptation, to escape lust, and it's a salvation that enables us to faithfully and lovingly obey God's will for our life. And if there's one thing that there's resistance to in our church today, it's this call to obedience. There, there's just something in it that when people hear that we must obey the commandments of God, there's a cry that goes out that the church is being legalistic and I shouldn't have to be commanded to do anything. My friends, you are a subject of the great and mighty King of heaven. 
Even as his children, he has expectations of faithfulness and obedience to his laws and his principles. And he has revealed in his word that if we're faithful to those principles, to those laws and those commandments, that it only brings good things to the lives of the people who faithfully obey. And it, we, we live in a time where I feel like we always have to, to undergird this call to obedience with going back over the, all of the ground of being saved by grace through faith. And we don't do it in our own strength. We do it in the strength of God. My friends, we should know this already. So when there's a call to obedience, we shouldn't resist and cry out, oh no, it's legalism. We should say, oh yeah, I should obey. And I should be faithful because God has saved me by his grace through faith. And now the life that I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I live by the power of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We shouldn't have to keep traveling over the same ground. We should be growing in our faith experience with the Lord. There are these ideas of salvation that are out there and they're questionable. And I'll share with those with you in just a moment. But from the beginning of time, there's only been one way of salvation. Today, salvation includes the acceptance of willful opposition to the revealed will of God. That's what some people think salvation is today. That it's okay to resist the will of God and do what I want to do because God's grace is sufficient for me. God's grace does not cover the item of rebellion. Amen? Amen. And so if we know to do good, like James says, and we don't do it to us, it's a sin and it's an act of rebellion. It's one thing to have a sin of ignorance. God can cover that and he forgives that when it's brought to our realization and we confess it but to openly live in rebellion to god there remains no more sacrifice for those who live in that manner so today salvation includes the acceptance of willful opposition to the revealed will of god the world says do what you please do what you think is right god's grace is sufficient for you Rarely is there a prayerful searching of the word of God to find the answer to the things that challenge us and our way of life. And if you hear something in your church, maybe a teaching or a doctrine, uh, and you feel like it's not acceptable, then your privilege and your duty is to go search that thing out. But I see so often that when people hear something that cuts across their path of convenience, their, the life that they want to live, they immediately discard it as heresy or that's not right or that's not what the Bible teaches or that's not for the church today, but how do you know if you're not opening up your Bible? In one of my Facebook groups, I, I have a, I'm in a bunch of different non-denominational Facebook groups. I, they're different denominations, but there's no specific denomination given to that group. And so I'm in uh, quite a few of them. And there was a person who had posted, and I was reading his post, and it was a beautiful post, by the way. He was, um, I think it, he said that he was at work, or maybe it was just an experience that he was having, but he just felt like he had, been, he had been distanced from God for a while, and that he just felt the strong urge to return to reading his Bible again. And I was reading, I'm, I'm like, praise the Lord. Whoever you are, whatever faith you're of, I'm so happy that you're hearing the voice of the Lord. And I was reading, as I was reading, he's, he was talking about his experience, and he says, yeah, he says, I decided today to bring my Bible to work, and he says, and I had time to read the first nine chapters of the book of Corinthians. And he posted a picture of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And I thought, that's amazing. But also in that, in that praise and, and that thanksgiving and that acknowledgement of this reconciliation with God, you could hear that there's this burden because he, he acknowledged that he had a problem with smoking and he was wondering if this is okay. And in his, in his heart, he was convicted that this thing wasn't okay. But he didn't really talk about it. It was just something that came into the conversation and went. And I thought, that's interesting. And I wanted to read the responses that people had given to his post. And, and so here's the, here's the question that I asked. How did how the group respond to this post? And, and I'll just give you two posts to give you an idea of what was said. The first person said, we aren't perfect. We're born into sin. Occasional, spo occasional smoking for social purposes uh, is okay. Call me wrong, but I don't see the harm. I mean, you can drink wine and alcohol, but you shouldn't get drunk. So I don't see what the difference is. As long as it's not mind-altering. This comes from another Christian. And I'm going to tell you that one puff of a cigarette, one drink from a cup of alcohol is mind-altering. 
So why do it? But yet we have one Christian who's decided not to reference the Scriptures, not to refer to the Bible or God's call to holiness, but just to say, hey, you know what? If it feels good, it's okay. Just do it in moderation. And we think that it's just happening in in other churches. My friends, it happens in our church too, these messages. Here's another one for you. Outside of the health consequences, I don't equate SIGs, uh, outside of the health consequences, I don't equate SIGs to backsliding. Signed, a cigar smoker. And so there's no condemnation because I don't know where they're at in their experience, but be careful what you share, especially when you have someone who's saying, I'm coming back to the Lord, and you're offering them information that's direct opposition to what God teaches. And you're confirming that the struggle that they're having, their desire for smoking or drinking is okay, and you can continue to do it because God's grace is sufficient. There's an attack on truth today. As I read this, I I had many questions come into my mind, and some of them were these. When did the requirement for holy living change? When did it change? This is one of the biggest crises in our our church today is a removal of the the way marks of, of the call to holy living that our pioneers established so many years ago. One piece after another is being removed. When was the call to holy living aborted? When were we relieved of the duties to be the temple of the Holy Spirit? When did that happen? When were we relieved from the command to do all to the glory of God in every area of our lives? When did that happen? Have the tenets of our faith become outdated? Should we be changing with the times? Change is good, my friends, but only if it's founded on biblical principles. God doesn't change. He says, I am the Lord, I do not change. And he would go on to say in this verse that because he doesn't change, the sons of Jacob aren't consumed. And that's just who he is. He's merciful, he's gracious, he's long-suffering, and he's full of goodness and truth. He doesn't change. And so he could, he could comfort Jacob with these words, but like Keith mentioned, this is a double-edged sword. Because when it comes to sin, and when it comes to truth, he doesn't change. Truth has always been truth, and if it wasn't truth, it wouldn't be truth. If that makes sense to you. So when I thought about this idea that God doesn't change, I want to suggest to you that he doesn't change in three specific ways. Number one, he doesn't change in his person. The Bible says in Psalm 90, verse 2, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. God has always been God, and he always will be God. And his person and his principles, they will never change. He is who he is, and his truths will always be what they are, and they will not be removed. They will always remain. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, in the New Testament, we hear that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, and he's the same today, and he's the same forever. And our Bibles say that he's the way, the truth, and the life. And so the way of salvation doesn't change, the truth doesn't change, and the promise, my friends, of eternal life doesn't change for all those who will believe and who will follow faithfully. His love doesn't change. I love this one. It says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. If you've ever felt that you've been without the love of God today, I want to let you know that his love for you doesn't change. Your love for him may change and vacillate. You're a sinful, fallen human being, and so am I. But whether we're up or we're down, whether we're doubting or discouraged, his love remains the same. It's an everlasting, unchanging, undaunted love, a love that lasts forever. And finally, his truth doesn't change. Who he is, his plans, his requirements here in 1 Peter 1.23. Peter says, Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. God's truths do not change. In Psalm 89, verses, verse 34, God says, My covenant I will not break. What I have spoken I will not change, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. And so we have to ask, what's changing? Is God's truth changing or is the world changing? I would say that the world is changing. And I would say that the world is changing the church and the church is on dangerous ground if it doesn't stand firmly upon the word of God. 
What has spoken by God can never be altered. And do you know who's attempting to alter the truths of God? You know who's behind all this? Satan, the father of lies. The only changes to our faith should be those specifically given in and by the word of God. Truth should be changing us over time. But truth never changes with the times. If truth were to change or to be altered, it would no longer be the truth. And so my friends, God doesn't change. Truth doesn't change. Salvation doesn't change. The commandments of God do not change. The requirements of God do not change. God's love, his everlasting love, does not change. There's a danger of changing with the times. We're being pressed more and more every single day to make life-altering changes based on the emotions and feelings of unsanctified people. To accept worldly norms and ideas is the appeal to all of humanity right now. And the arguments may even sound good and they may even sound rational, but unless they're supported by the word of God, my friends, we cannot nor shall we accept them. (coughs) Because of societal pressures and love for the world and the search for comfort and the search for less conflict, we are less inclined to follow the truth these days. And we're less inclined to follow the whole truth and nothing but the truth. We're being overwhelmed from so many different directions. And I know that you all feel it. Sometimes I can see it in your faces. I can see it in the way that you carry yourselves. And I'm there with you. We're all in the trenches right now. We're we're trying to hold on to what is right and and to push back what is wrong. And without divine power and strength, we, we will not win the battle. But you know what Paul says? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that we can become more than conquerors through him who loved us and gave himself for us. This is the message of the Bible. We don't have to to submit to the crazy teachings of the world. We can be protected by the teachings of God's divine word of power. More and more, when there is a call to faithfulness and Christian fidelity, and I mentioned this before, there's a call to holy living, there's a cry of legalism that quickly arises arises to quench the call to reformation. We're all about the message of revival. It's great to hear about the power of the Holy Spirit, but it's another thing to have him come into our life and make those necessary changes in preparation for the kingdom of heaven. No unholy thing will enter into the kingdom of God. And that, that sobers me up. Because I look at my life in comparison to the Holy One of God, and there is no comparison. I see my sinful life, and I see his righteous life, and I'm like, how how can I bridge that gap? And and, and God says, you can't. You cannot bridge that gap. But I have already bridged it for you. There is someone who I sent into this world, and his name was Jesus. And he died on the cross for you to bridge that gap that couldn't be bridged before. Before you were lost with no hope, and now you have all the hope and all the privilege that a a child of God could have. And it's beautiful to think that God today calls those who have put their faith in him sons and daughters of God. What a privilege to be called a son and a daughter of God. We should be growing in our understanding of the truth, not sacrificing its principles because it's what we think is best. And I hear that quite a bit. And the reason I think that I hear it is because people are growing weary. They're struggling and they're, they're stumbling along the way as they fight the good fight of faith and they feel that they can't make it. And so what we try to do sometimes is, is to keep ourselves from any more harm and, and try to save ourselves or put ourselves in a safe situation. And we can't do that, my friends, because when we do that spiritually, we begin to compromise our faith. We see that we're not attaining that goal, so we lower the goal so that we can quiet our consciences, consciences and so that our hearts can feel better. But that's not the way. The way is to go to God. And ask him for help to overcome that problem, that obstacle, that difficulty. And he will give you what you need. And I'll be the first to tell you that you may have to to round that track a few times. But it's okay. Because when Peter asked how many times he should forgive his brother, and then he kind of put it out there, seven times, right, Lord? Jesus said, no, no, no. Seventy times times seven, Peter. And that's the the period of time that he offered the Jewish nation. 
490 years of time he gave them. 490 years to be reconciled to himself. It's really beautiful that God's forgiveness is always available to all those who need it. God's power is always available to those who need it. So let's not lower the standards of Christianity. Let's raise the bar high and tell God we expect him to do what he's promised that he can do for us. The world is changing, but the pathway to eternity has not. And we must remember it was paved for us with faithful obedience and blood and love. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6 tell us to trust in the Lord with all of our hearts when we're traveling this, traveling this path. And don't lean on our own understanding, but in all of our ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct our path. And I love that passage because what it's telling us is that the same path that, we're, that, Jesus, that Jesus trod is the same path that we're called to walk in this life, but we don't do it alone. He'll always be with us as we walk that pathway back to the heavenly kingdom. The foundation of our faith is slowly shifting in, our, in this world from rock to sand. And there is a danger in hearing but not doing the word of God. And there's a subtle postmodern ideology floating around in the church today and it's beginning to grow. And if we're not careful, it will lead us away from eternal life. So what can we do? What can we do? Well, many people today are responding and making decisions based on their own emotions and based on presuppositions or the way they think things should be. We must be prayerful. We must be patient. We must be thoughtful and careful at every step and every point of conflict and decision. Make sure that we've counseled with the Lord. It may seem so simple and insignificant, the decisions that we're faced with, but every decision has a consequence for eternity. So if we're not careful... It could lead us in the wrong direction. And so my counsel today, what can we do? Very simple. Three words. Run to Jesus. Run to Jesus. He's your safety. He's your refuge. He's your very present help in trouble. He is your source of truth, and he is your salvation. Asking God specifically about anything you're unclear of. This is another point of counsel. Ask him anything. If you go back in your Old Testament writings, you'll see that every step in the New, in the New Testament too, they stop and they ask God very specific things like, here's a situation we're in. Here's the challenge that we're facing. What should I do in this specific moment in time? You know what happened? God actually answered the prayer. And you know what they did? They followed the counsel. You know what they did? They experienced victory. It's the same for us today. That is available to you and me today. It may seem so simple and insignificant, but we should be doing it. We should be seeking God on the things that we're unclear about, even if we think it's correct. And this is our privilege and what Jesus gave his life for. So my friends, times are changing in the world. They are. And I'm sad to, to, to see that there are people in our church that are, are questioning the very foundations of our faith. And I'm praying for them today. My friends... We have been given truth, and the truth has been established. And the only thing that we should ask for is a better understanding of the things that we've been given. And if you do question it, don't leave yourself to question in your own mind. Go and ask God about that question that you have so that you can make sure that the answer that you're receiving is correct. Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Times are changing, and we must meet the insurmountable and even life-threatening challenges but we can only do so by putting our faith and trust in the word of God. And so as we close this morning, I want to ask you, do you want to put your faith and trust in the word of God? Yes. Do you want to make sure that what you're doing and what you're following and what you're believing is true? Then let's put our faith in the word of God and in the God who's given it to us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that even though the times are changing, they're not changing for the better here in this world. They're changing for the, the worse, and the church is being impacted by it. It's slowly eroding individual faiths in the church, and it's also causing harm and detriment to the church. But we've been told by our pioneers that the church would look as though it's about to fall, but it would remain, and it would go through until the end. 
because it is the apple of your eye. And the people of this church are who you gave your life for. So today we look to you, Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, the word of God, the living truth. And we want to humbly tell you that we need you. And that we want to get back to the study of your word, like the, this man on Facebook who heard your voice and, and went back to opening his word and reading the scriptures for himself. I pray that this would be our motivation, that your spirit would, would fill us and, and set our hearts on fire to know you while we have time. And Father in heaven, thank you for the great salvation that you've given to us. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.